In October 1945, a violent labor dispute unfolded in the U.S. as a six-month strike by set decorators, part of the Conference of Studio Unions, escalated into a riot at Warner Brothers Studios in Burbank, California. Roughly 1,000 strikers were involved, leading to clashes and a chaotic melee featuring various weapons, including tear gas bombs. Around 50 casualties were reported with no serious injuries. These strikes influenced the 1947 Taft-Hartley Act, which curbed union power and strike tactics and led to the CSU disbanding with a reorganization of Iod at Sea leadership. This is the story of Hollywood Bloody Friday. On October 5th, 1945, during a six-month strike led by the Conference of Studio Unions outside Warner Brothers Studios, a violent confrontation erupted. The CSU, representing around 10,500 studio crew members, including painters and carpenters, had initiated the strike to secure representation for set decorators against rival Union International Alliance of Theatrical Stage Employees, or I at C. At 5.30 a.m., the situation intensified. The American flag was raised on the studio's roof, and some on the picket line sang the Star-Spangled Banner. However, tensions flared when fiery flares were launched toward the strikers, causing fear and chaos. The situation quickly escalated into one of the most violent clashes in Hollywood's history. One actor described the scene, with goons, replacements, deputies, and police officers attacking the strikers. People were severely injured, and arrests were made as law enforcement and security personnel engaged in brutal confrontations with the strikers. This event marked a significant and violent episode in the history of labor disputes in Hollywood, with long-lasting consequences for the film industry. The majority of people have so little that a week or two of unemployment or an illness wipes out the savings. Another company propaganda angle was that wage increases would cause inflation because the workers, with their war bonds, would have too much money. And the union asked for an increase of $2 a day. The conflict at Warner Brothers in 1945 marked a brutal episode in Hollywood's history of tensions between major studios and the labor force that sustains them. This struggle continues, as exemplified by the narrowly avoided Eye at Sea Strike in 2021, which could have had a devastating impact on the film and TV industry. Scholar Ronnie Regev, author of Working in Hollywood, notes that the attraction of the industry often obscures the reality of hard work behind the scenes. Hollywood producers capitalize on the mystique of filmmaking while overlooking the challenging labor conditions, pay disparities, and job insecurity. The industry, as described by Anthony A.P. Dawson in Hollywood's Labor Troubles from 1948, has long been characterized by a vast workforce seeking consistent employment in an industry that only utilizes a fraction of its workers, even during peak production. This historical perspective resonates with ongoing labor issues in Hollywood. The entertainment industry's unregulated working conditions date back to the Victorian era, with the International Alliance of Theatrical Stage Employees, or IAT, C forming in 1893 to represent those working behind the scenes in live theater, initially in New York. It aimed to encompass various professions within its organization to gain industry-wide influence. By 1905, IAT-C had expanded to organize crew members in the emerging film industry. 
leading to the establishment of chapters across the United States. I at Sea flexed its muscle in Hollywood with small strikes in 1918, 1919, and 1921, ultimately reaching its first agreement with the entertainment industry in 1926, known as the Studio Basic Agreement. This was not a traditional contract, but rather an agreement to negotiate wages, benefits, hours, working conditions, and address grievances. In the nearly 100 years since then, I at Sea has never gone on strike. In the 1930s, above the line workers, including actors, directors, and writers, organized unions with support from the pro-union Roosevelt administration. This shift was driven by the New Deal policies. The formation of unions, such as the Screen Actors Guild and Screen Writers Guild, now the WGA in 1933, and the Directors Guild of America in 1936 marked a significant development. These unions emerged due to the studio's prior resistance to recognition. However, these above-the-line guilds didn't always align their interests with the broader labor force represented by I at Sea. While the Writers Guild of America was more progressive, the other guilds often lacked solidarity with the below-the-line workers. Interestingly, even though the Screen Actors Guild went on strike in 1960 to advocate for residuals, it was led by Ronald Reagan, who, as President of the United States in 1981, took a strong stance against a different labor strike involving air traffic controllers. These guilds, by preferring to be called guilds rather than unions, revealed a conservative inclination and a reluctance to support other labor strikes. Why mafia goes on and on? Because mafia is something rooted in society. The mafia is infiltrating the economy, business. The king of the gangsters is about to get his, and a lot of Chicago folks are on hand at federal court for a last look at Scarface Al Capone before Uncle Sam puts him away. Here he comes. Then neither socialism nor communism ever will become established in America. In the Communist Manifesto, he called upon the workers, the proletarians, to rise up and overthrow their capitalistic masters. We mean to put these black market operators behind bars whenever and wherever we find them. In the 1930s, as the Hollywood studio system thrived, IATSE experienced significant membership growth. But this expansion had a darker side. By 1934, a crime syndicate linked to the imprisoned Al Capone had gained control of I at Sea, placing Willie Byoff, a former pimp, and corrupt stagehand George Brown as its leaders. Allegedly, they brokered deals between the studios and the mob, using extortion to prevent labor unrest. Hollywood's labor force was well aware of I at Sea's corruption. In 1937, around 6,000 movie workers, including scenic artists and makeup artists, formed the Federation of Motion Picture Crafts, or FMPC. They demanded recognition from the studios and embarked on a two-month strike to break free from I at Sea's tainted leadership. Regrettably, other unions, such as SAG, did not support them, and I at Sea and the studios employed mobsters and LAPD members to attack the strikers and picketers. The FMPC dissolved as quickly as it was established, I at Sea faced its own reckoning in 1941, when Byoff and Brown were arrested and convicted of extortion. Johnny Roselli, the mob intermediary between I at Sea and the studios, also faced legal repercussions, exposing the union's unsavory dealings. In the same year, disillusioned movie workers established the Conference of Studio Unions, or CSU, led by Herb Sorrell, a former boxer and studio painter. Many I at Sea members left to join CSU, drawn by the promise of democratic leadership and effective bargaining actions. In response to the defections from I at Sea, 
The union and the studios falsely alleged that the liberal CSU had communist affiliations, an accusation that would haunt the upstart union throughout its existence. During this period, the I at Sea, a major labor union representing workers in the entertainment industry, was divided along ideological lines. A faction within I at Sea, known as the CSU, had connections to communist or left-wing groups. The CSU sought to challenge the I at Sea leadership, which was viewed as more conservative and anti-communist. The rivalry between I at Sea and CSU led to strikes and labor conflicts in Hollywood during the late 1940s. The CSU organized strikes and picket lines to push for better working conditions, while the I at Sea leadership, along with studio executives, opposed their efforts. In the late 1940s and early 1950s, the United States was gripped by anti-communist fervor, with Senator Joseph McCarthy leading the charge. Hollywood was not exempt from this hysteria, as the House Un-American Activities Committee conducted investigations into alleged communist influence in the entertainment industry. The Hollywood Ten and others were blacklisted for refusing to cooperate with House Un-American Activities Committee, resulting in their inability to work in the industry. Frustrated by I at Sea and the studio's treatment of their workers, CSU initiated a strike on March 12, 1945. The strike had a significant impact, with The Hollywood Reporter noting that nearly 60% of production was halted, affecting 12,000 film workers. Over 10,000 CSU members joined the strike, picketing major studios and theaters. Some crew members employed clever tactics to dissuade ticket buyers from attending movie screenings. The strike took a violent turn as I at Sea members clashed with CSU picketers. Actors in SAG had to make individual choices. Progressive stars like Bette Davis and Jennifer Jones refused to cross the picket lines, while Charlie Chaplin expressed his stance against crossing picket lines. Many actors, including Ronald Reagan, crossed the picket lines with Reagan describing a bleak picture of union unrest, including instances of violence and intimidation. By October, the situation had become highly charged, causing substantial financial losses for the studios. Film production, including projects like David Selznick's Duel in the Sun and Cary Grant's Night and Day, had been significantly impacted, and daily pickets occurred at major studios. Protesters often faced armed strike breakers with support from the Los Angeles Police Department, closely linked to the studios. Inside the studios, the atmosphere oscillated between despair and decadence, resembling a castle under siege. On October 29, 1945, an agreement was reached among the studios, I at Sea and the CSU. It was considered a mixed victory, with CSU recognized as the bargaining agent for set decorators, but I at Sea still had some jurisdiction. Any remaining jurisdictional issues would be decided by a three-person panel, and both striking workers and their replacements had specific terms regarding severance pay and job reinstatement. The brief truce came to an end when, in July 1946, Sorrel and CSU initiated another strike, successfully securing a 25% pay increase for workers. However, this victory would prove short-lived. In September of that same year, a dispute between I at Sea and CSU over control of set building led to the major studios locking out CSU workers. This lockout, orchestrated by the studios I at Sea and SAG, now led by movie star Robert Montgomery, effectively removed CSU workers from the set without an official strike declaration from the union. Once again, this period was marked by violence and turmoil as reported by publications like the Los Angeles Times and the Hollywood Citizen News. Incidents included beatings, clubbings, property damage, home invasions, and the use of Molotov cocktails. Picketing workers were arrested in large numbers and taken to local jails. Amidst these challenges, a group of female picketers in the Lincoln Park Jail found solace and unity through singing. The movie industry was also grappling with post-World War II economic difficulties, increased competition from foreign films, and the emergence of television. Hollywood's labor troubles during this period had a significant impact, with a substantial portion of the workforce going on strike, 
reaching about 13% of the production staff. During the lockout that extended into 1947, the film industry took advantage of the situation to remove CSU members and their supporters from studio payrolls. As the lockout persisted, CSU lost influence and eventually dissolved. By the 1950s, CSU had effectively ceased to exist, allowing I at Sea to regain its prominence. The impact of these labor struggles was significant, leading to the passage of the 1947 Labor Management Relations Act, commonly known as the Taft-Hartley Act. This legislation restricted union power and strike tactics. It also prompted the House Un-American Activities Committee to conduct a notorious nine-day hearing on allegations of communist influence, resulting in the Hollywood blacklist and causing harm to numerous lives. Subsequent major strikes, such as the 1960 SAG strike and the WGA strikes in 1973, 1988, and 2007, along with smaller strikes like the three-hour DGA strike in 1987, occurred in the industry. However, the level of labor management tension and confrontation that characterized the events of that fateful October morning in 1945 was never fully replicated. We're gonna turn now to the breaking news overnight in Hollywood on the brink of shutting down. Actors failed to reach a deal with the major studios. Tonight, Hollywood is completely closed for business. Members of the Screen Actors Guild voted to go on strike today after failing to reach a deal with major studios. This morning, for the first time in 63 years, two major Hollywood unions have walked off the job, bringing the film and TV industry to a halt. They would shut down the biggest entertainment industry strike in decades. Biggest walkout in four decades. In the end, they couldn't reach an agreement. Among the unresolved issues, demands for higher wages, an increase in residuals as streaming services command more of the market, and new protections from the use of artificial intelligence. This morning, Hollywood actors can finally get back to work after an unprecedented 118 days on the picket lines. Breaking news, sag after appears to have ended the longest actor strike in Hollywood history. According to Variety, the LA Times, there is a tentative agreement. The strike officially ends at midnight. The union's negotiating committee unanimously approving the deal with the national board set to review it on Friday. This agreement introduces AI protections for actors and a significant pay increase. You share in the wealth because you cannot exist without us. Thank you.